they kept going until they literally couldn't move the load. So let's say you're doing a calf raise, you're doing a calf raise, you're doing a calf raise, you can't reach the top anymore. Yeah. You start doing that, you start doing that, and then you're at the bottom and you yeah. can't move at all. Yikes. What a painful study to put people through. Do they have a cattle prod? Yeah, I think they had tasers. It was a uh, very... <laughs> Did they tase the people to get the electric current to get them more calf raises, or was it more of a threat? Like, if you don't keep going... No, they didn't want to ruin the study design, yeah, so they tased right. them in the neck, not in the calf. My, that, that would throw things off. Sense. Yeah, you got to keep yeah. the consistency. The IRB there. will just let any study get published nowadays. For sure. Here's a trippy line of questions. <laughs> Apparently, there are there is a recent study that tested training beyond failure. Now, my high school principal told me I was one of the illustrious students that went beyond failing school. Mm. I was that bad at it. Um, what the hell is beyond failure? How do we even contextualize that? What was the study? What did it find? Tell us the story. Yeah. So I think just as a preface going into just the failure literature in general, mm. I think is, is somewhat useful. So I'm talking think, about my life story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can f fail in a whole lot of different ways, <laughs> yes. right? Unlimited so, failure, my new book out in March. <laughs> exactly. So because of the fact that exercises have different resistance curves, there's actually an unlimited amount of ways to fail and where you'll fail. Yes. So, failing here, failing here, failing here. Yeah, exactly. Failing so, here. Yeah, yeah, that's the that that one hits the hardest. Oh sure. yeah, yeah. We fail in the gym, so we don't have to fail that's out right. in the real world. But then you still fail in the real world. Like that. Like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I have failing everywhere. Yeah, exactly. So typically, the way failures operationalized in the literature is somewhat squirrely, honestly, because of the fact that we have something called volitional failure, which mm -hmm. usually means that the person believes that they couldn't do another rep with good form. And then you have true concentric failure, true concentric task failure, which is somewhat of a corollary to form failure. And the reason why I say that that gets a little bit murky is that depending on the degrees of freedom that you allow for the individual, concentric failure and form failure really mean the same thing because let's say you're doing a bicep curl. If you were to keep strict form the whole time, you would just fail right about here right. and then go down. But if you allowed the person to do a whole bunch of swinging and so on, yeah, they've the, really the failed task the as, task. Yeah, the task exactly. is get this to this. You got Olympic weightlifting shit going on. Exactly. I yes. don't love that definition of failure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think using the form which was prescribed and saying concentric failure is a lot more consistent. Yes. Especially. And we don't care yeah. where in concentric failure, if you cannot complete the next repetition, exactly. you're done. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, and then just generally speaking, so I can paint the picture for this beyond failure, generally speaking, you can keep a few reps in reserve, you know, one, two, and get similar amounts. So a recent study, Rafalo and colleagues did a really good job of mm -hmm. elegantly showing this where they did leg press, leg extension, within subject design the leg press was two reps in reserve so two reps from failure leg extension one rep in reserve other leg went to failure no differences between groups generally the literature points this way yes so now this study comes along and i'll describe the design they did also within subject design these were untrained subjects and it was a calf raise so they had one leg do calf raises to task failure and so generally that's at the top so if you can't reach the top of a calf raise you're done you're the cut. annoying lockout portion yeah the hardest part of the calf yeah raise. exactly yeah and then the other group which they called the dorsiflexion failure group which basically just means that they kept going until they literally couldn't move the load. So let's say you're doing a calf raise, you're doing a calf raise, you're doing a calf raise, you can't reach the top anymore. Yeah. You start doing that, you start doing that, and then you're at the bottom and you yeah. can't move at all. Okay, so another way to define it is group one could not complete a concentric repetition. Group two went so much further, they couldn't start a concentric repetition. Exactly. I, somebody, and you've gone to super failure, especially on like lengthened machines. Someone's like, do more flies. And you're like, you're done. And they're like, exactly. try harder. You're like, dude, you don't understand. Trying harder doesn't mean I get to here and then quit. This is it. Exactly. Yikes. What a painful study to put people through. Do they have a cattle prod? Yeah, I think they had tasers. It was a very... <laughs> Did they tase the people to get the electric current to get them more calf raises or was it more of a threat? Like if you don't keep going, 
No, they didn't want to ruin the study. This is yeah, not true. They tased right. them in the neck, not in the calf. My, that, that would throw makes things total off. Sense. Yeah, you got to yeah. keep the consistency. The IRB there. will just let any study get published nowadays. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then let me ask you a quick question. What was the volume of training that they employed offhand? It was a moderate volume. I don't actually remember offhand the exact amount of sets, but it wasn't. A Nothing crazy. High. Yeah, yeah. If a couple I had to times guess, a week. It was probably two times a week for probably like, you know, five sets per session. Three to so six three, sets, something yeah, like yeah, that. Exactly. Got it. Yep. How most people don't even train calves because most people don't train calves. Exactly. Watch this. Hey, Scott, mm -hmm. how much calf volume do you do per week? Like six sets. All That's right. pretty good, man. Gonna, yeah. Calves are so hard to justify training in your own mind because like, you're supposed to be training them, but you mm -hmm. don't give a shit. But other people will critique you for having small calves. Mm -hmm. It's like brushing your hair when you wake up. Like, I don't care how my hair looks, but I have to go to work and they care. Yeah, I think uh, social media did this where I think just making fun of calves became a meme. Yeah. And now we just all begrudgingly dream yeah, calves. Yeah, I want to become a meme. I think we should just agree that yeah. nobody cares about calves. A little silent just, handshake. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's how most Illuminati meetings go. They're like, <laughs> no calves, right? I'm like, fellas, I love being around you. Exactly. The Vanderbilts are there. It's great. All right. What do they find? More growth in the beyond failure condition, which <clears throat> going back to the literature on failure, people lost their minds. They're like, wait, if you can get similar growth from failure versus non-failure training, what the heck is going on here? They went well beyond failure. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's two considerations there. One is considering the position. So you have the top of a calf raise where you fail, and then you have the other group, which was accumulating a whole lot of hypertrophic volume in that more stretch position. And we actually like have many more reps in that stretch. Many position. more. Yeah. If you assume that the bottom third, which I think is reasonable based on all the studies mm -hmm. now, that the bottom third of the rep does a much bigger <clears> proportion <throat> of the total growth stimulus. If you like add five bottom third reps to a set, that's like the equivalent of three or four more reps total. And if you add eight, that's like six more reps. Like that's a very different amount of total volume at that sure. point. Yeah. 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 So the two considerations there that I think people had a hard time conceptualizing is one, you're accumulating more volume in a more yes. hypertrophic position. Much but two, more volume. You're accumulating much more volume to the point where I would consider this more of an intensity technique than I even would consider it something like a straight set. Like it's a, just a completely different concept. Over time, if you lost one rep, here or there by leaving a few reps in reserve, your total volume load is usually fairly similar because yes. of the fact that you're more fatigued for the next set and so on, where yes. it kind of all washes out. Yes. But in this context, it's much, much different. It's more similar to a drop set, where if you did you know, three drop sets, yes. the accumulation of stimulus even Huge. is just different. And yeah, so it's exactly. a combo of two things. One is much more volume, but also it's much more volume at the most growth promoting end of the range of motion. Yeah, for a muscle that honestly has been shown to be by far the most, like the poster child for stretch sensitivity because so, yeah, you can stretch the shit out of a fucking calf. Mm -hmm. The RP Hypertrophy app has dozens of pre-made workout templates to help you build a plan faster than any other training software allows. But you can customize each plan exactly to your needs by prioritizing and deprioritizing any muscles you like to train, choosing the exact exercises you'd like to use, and customizing the volumes you employ at every single step of the process. If you're looking to bring up lagging muscle groups, look no further than the RP Hypertrophy app Click on the link in the description of this video to get started. So practical takeaways from this for me is like, if you have an exercise on which the failure point is in that top end of the contraction, it might behoove you to do some integrated partial reps at the end of the set. So pull downs or pull ups. As many reps as you can get, let's say you're going to failure that day or even two reps in reserve, mm -hmm. as many reps as you can get touching the bar to your chest or getting the chin above the bar. And then another two reps in reserve set after like a second of rest still in the machine mm -hmm. of like pulling your way halfway up or a third of the way up. Agree? Disagree? Yeah, I think that's super reasonable for basically things that have a resistance curve that you're failing in the shortened position doing some extra reps 
in that position, I think is a, a good idea. Yeah. Um, either as integrated within a set or as afterwards. afterwards. Yep. Um, I think one really interesting question, at least for the Cav, is do you even need to do that top portion? Right. Somewhat open question. I, I think I've heard Jared say this where not doing the top portion sort of feels like uh, not getting your birthday cake or something like it feels like something's incomplete. And yeah. I kind of agree with that. There is there is some yeah. just it's nostalgia great for tracking too. Yeah, that's you true. know, when you're at the top, um, I will say recently I've started training calves such that my failure point I count as about the halfway point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess an interesting way to do that study if that study and I don't mean to critique the study authors mm -hmm. excellent excellent study shows us a ton if you wanted to truly design a study to test past failure condition you would assign failure as whatever all the way to the end of can't move and then you would make both groups do that and one would stop at two reps in reserve of that mm. where the other group would still do it so there's no range of motion differences or anything like that mm. but then you know if they did that study, they would just find more or less the same shit was always found, which <laughs> yeah. is like, yeah, two RIR is fine. Yeah, but yeah. this way, what they found was that for some exercises, yeah, partial reps at the end of a set essentially can meaningfully impact growth results. Mm -hmm. The only thing I'm thinking is you got to consider tracking, not a big deal because halfway is pretty easy to tell. Yeah. The other th big thing you have to consider is fatigue especially psychological fatigue, just something to throw out there into the wind. We'll see what, mm. what your take on this is when you do a set to failure and that set is lockout failure on the calves, mm. it's tough. You got to really fucking try, but a set to total failure inability to begin the concentric, mm. which is technically at that point, even eccentric failure, mm. Um, mm. that takes something much more out of you. Like the people going all the way to can't move failure. There's only so many sets like that. Now for calves, yeah. not a huge deal. Yeah, Forearms, that, not a big that deal. Be my, yeah. Nobody training their quads like that, man. You know what I mean? For sure. So is that something that you would recommend to people do out in the wild? Or would you recommend it and say, look, try it, but see if it doesn't fuck you up super bad. What do you think? Yeah, I think for certain muscles, I think it's okay. So I think lateral raises, I've been really playing around with that. It doesn't really mess me up too much. I get to that like sort of you know, 25 degree angle yes. at the end of the yes. set. And I almost feel like it's incomplete if I do the full, I, I get a much better sensation. So sometimes at the top where I can't, it's just so hard at the top yes. where it just does feels incomplete almost yes. similar to a row where it's just yes. like, I could get so much yes. more juice out of here where finding a standardized mid range there, not like can't move at all, which would yeah. be absurd, especially for a lateral oh race because God. obviously there's no load and right. you'd have to like move like a centimeter and you'd, <laughs> You'd not you're recommend like a it. Three sure. minute long set. You're just yeah. confused the exactly. whole time. Exactly. So I'd yeah. say use exercises that are just generally less, especially psychologically fatiguing. But overall, I would also just based on the results of other studies. So one study actually directly looked at partial calf raises. So Cassiano did partial bottom, partial top versus full. And partial bottom grew more substantially more than both conditions and full grew more than partial at the shortened position. So the fact that you saw pretty substantial growth from that lengthened position in the calf to me suggests that one do some volume. And I think it's sort of in line in line with what you're doing or you're stopping sort of at that like midway point. Yeah. And then also integrate some of that standardization so basically i'll have half the sets where they'll go all the way and then stop in the middle and then half the sets where it's you stop in the middle and then you go back down so basically yeah. half partials and half full ending in like yes. a flat yes. position yeah that's awesome